Imagine getting on your bike at night, with a monotonous attire on. How will you ensure that cars and other cyclists can still see you on the road? One simple solution would be to attach bright lights in the front and rear of your bike, making you more visible at night. Now, imagine that you are a scientist. During a disease like cancer or diabetes, how much of certain proteins are made or where they are localized to is often dysregulated. You need to track the changes in order to understand what is causing the disease. But the problem is that proteins cannot be easily observed under the microscope. So what can you do? Well, it turns out that the use of brightly colored lights works well not only for bikes, but also in the lab. Immunofluorescence is a technique commonly used by scientists to visualize proteins and their subcellular localization in the cell. Just like the immune system, the word immuno suggests the use of antibodies and antigen in this technique. Most proteins carry an antigenic part. Immunofluorescence requires the design of a primary antibody that binds specifically to the antigen on the protein of interest. The specific part of antigen where it binds to is called the epitope. In the direct method of immunofluorescence, the primary antibody has a fluorescent tag called fluorochrome. Upon excitation by a specific wavelength of light, the fluorochrome emits lights, thus allowing scientists to be able to see the protein of interest. Then what is the indirect method about, you may wonder. Besides having a primary antibody to bind to the protein of interest, an additional antibody is required, called the secondary antibody. It binds to the epitope of the primary antibody and carries the fluorochrome instead. More often, scientists prefer the indirect method due to two main reasons. Firstly, the indirect method has a signal amplification effect. Secondary antibodies are polyclonal and often bind to multiple epitopes, also known as the FC region, on the tail of one primary antibody, resulting in many fluorochrome labeling one protein and hence the signal amplification effect. In the direct method, however, monoclonal primary antibodies can only bind to the protein in a one-to-one -one ratio, resulting in lesser fluorochrome labeling the protein. The second reason is that the indirect method is more cost-saving. Primary antibodies are usually very expensive, with a price that is similar to buying a new smartphone. If a new primary antibody has to be bought every time the scientist wants to change the color of fluorochrome, it would be costly. Thus, many scientists would rather use the indirect method because they only need to vary the secondary antibody while using the same primary antibody. The good thing about using secondary antibodies to vary the color of fluorochrome is because they can bind to the FC region of many types of primary antibodies. Hence, scientists can save costs and reuse them on different target proteins and experiments. Without further ado, let's go through the procedures of carrying out immunofluorescence. Step 1. Fixation Our cells have cytoskeleton which is spread out over the cytoplasm and consists of filaments made up of different proteins. A type of fixative called formaldehyde is added to link the protein of interest to the cytoskeleton in a covalent manner. This step is important as it helps to prevent the protein from moving around in the cell and thus we can determine where the protein is found. Step 2. Permeabilization in order to allow the antibodies to cross the cell membrane and have access to the protein of interest, detergents such as Triton is added to break the cell membrane. Step 3. Blocking Due to the sticky nature of antibodies, they may sometimes bind to non-target proteins. Blocking buffers such as serum is added to block these non-specific binding sites, hence allowing scientists to locate the actual protein of interest. Last but not least, primary and secondary antibodies are added to visualize the protein of interest. I have a question. How am I supposed to interpret the results? Don't worry, let's take a look at this image here. In this experiment, a green fluorochrome was tagged onto the secondary antibody, which indirectly binds to the protein of interest. Hence, this green color represents the target protein. Let's look at the image labeled DAPI. DAPI is a blue fluorescent dye used to bind to DNA present in the nucleus, acting sort of like a marker to show scientists where the nucleus is. Lastly, in the overlay image, it's pretty obvious that the green color overlaps with the blue color, right? Do you know what that means? Does that mean that the protein is found in the nucleus? That's right! With this concept of co-localization, you can find out if your protein of interest is in the nucleus or any specific organelle. For example, you can use an antibody that binds specifically to the proteins in the mitochondria to show you where the mitochondria is.
Just like what this experiment did. Here, you can see where your proteins of interest, mitochondria and nucleus are. In the merged image, you can also infer two things. Firstly, the green color overlaps with the red color to form a yellow color. Hence, it means that the protein of interest is found in the mitochondria. Secondly, you can also confirm that the protein of interest is not found in the nucleus because the green does not overlap with the blue color. I see. What if the color representing the protein of interest does not overlap with any of the markers? Is it found in the cytoplasm? You're partially right, but there's one thing to note. There is a difference between the cytoplasm and cytosol. Do you think that the protein of interest is found in the cytoplasm or cytosol here? Hmm, cytoplasm? It is actually the cytosol. The cytoplasm of a cell consists of both the cytosol and the organelles. Cytosol is the part of the cytoplasm not held by any of the organelles in the cell. Cytosolic proteins are able to diffuse and distribute all over the cells, thus forming a non-granular and diffused image. On the other hand, cytoplasmic organelle staining is usually granular and non-diffuse like this, as proteins in organelles are not able to freely diffuse all over the cell, thus forming a granular image.